we're on. Hey there, welcome back to the 1455 interview series. Always a pleasure to have you. It's certainly always a pleasure for me. I learn a lot and have a lot of fun every time I talk to another writer. Um, th this one is special to me. Uh, it's always an honor and a blessing to be in the presence of the inimitable and ageless Ethelbert Miller. Uh, he has been involved with 1455. Uh, which I'm very proud of and humbled by. He's been involved in both of our literary festivals. We shared the stage at DC's historic Potter's House this past February. Uh, he readily agreed to be part of this series, which makes me happy. Um, and if you aren't familiar with him, you're, gonna, you're going to be uh, in the next 20 minutes. And I hope this really inspires you to check out his work because from prose to poetry, he's an important, wonderful human being. And let me... Uh, properly introduce him with a bio, which he told me to shorten. His official bio is long because he's done so much, but I'll <laughs> read the semi-abbreviated version. E. Ethelbert Miller is a writer and literary activist. He's the author of two memoirs and several books of poetry, including the collected poems of E. Ethelbert Miller, a comprehensive collection that represents over 40 years of his work. For 17 years, Miller served as the editor of Poet Lore, the oldest poetry magazine published in the United States. He's the host of the weekly WPFW morning radio show On the Margin with E. Ethelbert Miller and host and producer of The Scholars on UDC TV. In recent years, Miller's been inducted into the 2015 Washington DC Hall of Fame and awarded the 2016 AWP George Garrett Award for Outstanding Community Service in Literature. Ethelbert Miller. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. It's always a pleasure to see you, my friend. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. Okay. Well, then let's let's get it on. I told I, I told you these weren't going to be difficult, but I'm certainly <laughs> excited to hear your answers. And oh, sometimes I forget to do this. Uh, the obligatory stopwatch. We are now okay. on the clock. Okay, Ethelbert. The first book that made you want to be a writer, or a book that profoundly changed your life. I think it's two. Uh, one would probably be The Big Sea by Langston Hughes. Uh, and then the other would probably be The Price of the Ticket by James Baldwin, which is you know, a body of his work. Uh, I find that I can always go back to that book, you know, for inspiration as well. Sometimes a quote if something I'm, I'm working on. Outstanding. If you could say, and I know this is a very difficult question, so maybe not the, but one of the profound artistic influences in your life. Uh, probably June Jordan, I think would be the major influence on my life. Uh, and I say that in terms of her work. Uh, her friendship, uh, and just the type of writer that she was in terms of the issues that she was committed to. So I think that would always be a, a very um, inspirational person in my life. Excellent. How about an album or movie? I know there's an easy, for, not going to be easy for you to say an album. Oh, that's very easy. I mean, I'll probably I, recommend without reservation. Okay, uh, probably the, uh, my favorite movie is definitely The Godfather. You know, that's, that's not even close. Uh, <laughs> and then I guess my uh, favorite album might be uh, John Coltrane's Ballads. Ballads, okay. Um, I, I, what I, I took this interview last week and I did a Love Supreme, but I, 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 I had a feeling it was going to be a culture album. I don't know why, but just had a feeling. All right, another impossible one. Doesn't have to be the, the answer, but what is one of the best opening or closing lines in a book? Um, that's interesting because you know I usually uh, it might be in the. Um, might be Bob Dylan's uh, memoir, you know, where he's he's, he's meeting the box Jack Dempsey, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, I I just have that in, in terms of in terms of beginning, you know, um, because at one time I was teaching memoir workshops. I was always looking at the first line, you know, of of, mm -hmm. of a book, um, and especially a memoir. That's sort of how you get pulled into a person's life. Um, so uh, I think it might have been it might have been that. But I've read so many books, I I can't think in terms of like the first line. I might think of a chapter or, or a scene in the book. But, sure. um, you know, it's not like you know, the best of times, the worst of times, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Although that's been used twice already. <laughs> unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly. All right. How about the most underrated author? Oh, yeah. underrated author? Um, probably Amazu Zubol, you know, who I knew very well. You know, uh, I, I find that sometimes some of his friends don't mention his name. Um, I find that people who um, people talk about, I know that Amazu Bolton had a significant influence on their life. You know, like for example, I knew that Amazu Bolton had a key influence on Wanda Coleman. 
Uh, he had an influence on I. He had an influence on George Kendrick. He had definitely influence on Lorenzo Thomas. Uh, because when I met him in 73, 74, you know, he was a person walking around saying, you know, I'm a publisher. And he published many people. You know, he was a person, we were talking about like Sammy Delaney before people were talking about Octavia Butler, you know, but he was very much into um, writing science fiction poetry, you know, which was definitely something that I found fascinating and affected my work. But I would definitely say um, Amos U. Bolton, and especially because of the oral tradition that people underscore. And Amos was phenomenal. And then Amos had to say like, you know, what's this thing with the folk? You know, we're the folk. I, you want to hear some folklore? Here's some folklore. <laughs> but I, I would definitely put him at the top of the list. Okay. Is there a particular work that someone that's just checking him out would, would do? Well, his collection, his collection is called Nigger Day Men, you know, which is his body of work. Um, but, you know, um, he was just a person that when I met him, he was also the poetry editor, along with Alan Austin of the magazine Black Box with the little two cassette tapes. And he had replaced um, Etheridge Knight as the editor uh, of, of Black Box. And um, in fact, one of the people that was an influence on it was, was Etheridge Knight. Because when Amos was in Germany in the military, he met Etheridge Knight's sister, I believe, who was in the military, and told her about, okay, you, you might want to read my, my brother's work. And that's where that connection between Amos U. Bolton and Etheridge Knight. But definitely a person whose name I try to mention as much as possible is Amos U. Bolton. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for dropping that knowledge. Um, all right, there's one admittedly self-indulgent question in this series, and I, it's provocative, but I have a feeling I know what you're going to say. Why haven't you read Moby Dick, or if you have, is there a classic that you haven't got? That's interesting. To? You know, I don't, I don't read online, you know, but you know, when you get this whole thing of like books that you can download free, the one book I did download free was Moby Dick, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then I think also, uh, I, I don't mind I did that because, you know, I, I've gotten a better understanding of the American authors, you know, so people like Hawthorne and Emily Dickinson, you know, I find are just as important as say uh, Walt Whitman. You know, people who were very key around the time of, you know, of, of, our, of our country. Uh, and so I've gotten a very much uh, appreciation of some of the writers, you know, you know, Melville, you know, um, you know, Dickerson, um, Whitman, Frost, because they represent a time. You know, see, for, for example, I got into literature in the 1920s through the Harlem Renaissance New Negro Movement yeah. in County Collin. And what happens is that they're not just very important writers, they're very important individuals because their lives are being shaped by, like, say, the, the, the jazz era or, the, or after World War I or the Depression. And I think that's something that as I go back and say, okay, these are writers, Mel Professor, the others, when the country was divided. When the country was just trying to find itself as define itself as the United States, you know, or you know, you take something like Melville. Okay, you go to his book Moby Dick to learn about democracy, you know, um, and so this is where the work becomes instruction. And I, I, I thank you for you just put that perfectly. I think that's that's one of my main uh, points of contention is that people either think or assume from what they've heard that it is this boring white book by this white guy. <laughs> It's about white people. And the reality is, you know, he wrote that before Leaves of Grass and was truly celebrating this very democratic, if extremely, um, you know, hierarchical society. But that included, you know, many skin colors. And, right. and, you know, and some of it I found it was places where it's very funny, too. <laughs> I, I, absolutely. Absolutely. OK. Um, awesome. Um, very challenging one question here, but if you could say, is there a single theme or issue that your work addresses? I think my work, um, there's a couple of themes, definitely um, uh, loneliness, uh, solitude. Uh, I, I think that my work is also tied around issues of desire. You know, I feel that some of my best work are, are, are love poems. Um, and I feel that that's something that um, once I'm gone, I want people to look, look at those poems first, you know. Um, I, I want to be looked at the same way somebody looks at Naruda. You know, you know, you can look at the politics and things like that. You can look at Chile, but then there's something else that's here that you turn to in a moment of intimacy with someone else. And I and I and I've seen that. You know, some people, you know, um, 
you know, have taken my poems and they've been very important in terms of a line or two that they were putting a card to someone. So I feel in that case, it gets back to what I feel is very important about a beloved community, you know, that you be given, leave a body of work that people draw upon that is, that is uplifting, uh, is reminding that the key organ in our lives is, is our heart. And so I want to be remembered for that. Well, I think you will be. And, and I would say, um, I would just add to that my own as a fan and reader, there's just this tremendous humanity and always a sense of history uh, suffusing virtually everything that you write, which is manages to do a lot. And, and usually, and, and you, you're able to do it succinctly and powerfully. Um, but yeah, I think your legacy is, is well assured uh, with that. Okay, how about writing routines? Do you believe in them? Do you have one? No, I don't believe in that. You know, <laughs> um, I mean, when I when I when I lived alone, you know, many of my times I, I I write when I was in the shower and I hop out. But then after a while, you're married, you got kids, you can't do that. Uh, I'm writing all the time. You know, um, I don't I don't really, you know, labor over, uh, you know, with like a writer's block or something like that. Sometimes, you know, I have my poems might begin in in a in a blog or a letter to somebody. You know, um, but every day I'm writing and and. Um, um, you know, I try to make sure that I'm the, the discipline of writing is what I do. And sometimes the key thing is this letter writing, which some people have gotten away from. Sure. Well, I think the key thing is doing it every day, right? Which right. really kind of answers the next question already. What are your thoughts on writer's block? I don't have one, you know, I don't, I, you know, sometimes, you know, people like, you know, oh, but these characters are not talking to me today. Well, I think you should talk to your therapist. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, I just never had that, you know. Um, I mean, there's one person who I always remind, you know, who died you know, many, many years ago. But he lived across the street from me when I was living in downtown Washington. And that was my friend Ed Cox. And I love Ed Cox because Ed, Ed lived across the street from me. But he wrote the longest, beautiful letters, you know, like Thomas Burton quotes. He had a beautiful penmanship, you know. And then you, I would go to his house, and you know, he had to write the small one-bedroom apartment, and everything was the third, fourth copy was all in order and folders and stuff. And and I came out of his I, every time I would leave his apartment, I would say, "Oh man, I want to be like Ed. Hey, that's what a writer's supposed to be. They supposed to have a nice file cabinet." <laughs> <laughs> Well, right, you know, writers are inveterate letter writers, um, and and I guess that's emails these days. But mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, maybe maybe that gets lost in the e ether. But sure. um, okay, how about uh, talk about a, a significant setback, artistic or otherwise, in your life? Oh, I'm always have setback. I, I think that you know, at this point in my life, you know, maybe this is what I'm trying. I'm working on. Most people don't have my work. You know, people don't understand my work. Just like I was talking to somebody interviewing me. And they say, oh, you know, you were teaching with teaching and, you know, you have your students and you're at, you're at Howard for 40 years. And I had to tell people, I never taught, I wasn't on the faculty at Howard, you know. And I had to tell them, I do have students that I taught, <laughs> but they were at Bennington, they were at UNLV. Many of the students that I taught are not African-American, they're mostly white or Korean. You know, those are my students that when I say, oh, you know, this is, Edward is my teacher. Yeah, I'm with so-and-so's teacher. Now, from somebody that came up to me when I was at Howard with a, with, a, with, a, with a few poems and I gave them some feedback, I don't think I was teaching them. I was pretty much saying, okay, this is nice and, you know, <laughs> just take this word out of the second stanza. That's not teaching. You know, that's just me lending an ear and listening and being supportive. But for those people who I taught, you know, and I think my favorite student which still would probably be Tracy um, Guzio, who was my student at UNLV, who today is an expert on John Edgar Wyman. Mm. Uh, and I, I just, you know, I just, and I introduced her to John Edgar Wyman when um, she took my class at UNLV. Well, you mentioned Howard and you mentioned, you know, your role as a mentor and teacher. How, how would you, as succinctly as possible, describe how you've built your career? I built my career because I knew I wanted to have a, I wanted to have a literary career. I knew at that time that, you know, uh, if you were going to be remembered, you had to have some sort of institution affiliation. When I came to Howard University, like in 68, and I wasn't even, you know, writing that many poems and stuff. I wasn't even thinking about being a writer. But I knew at that time, you know, while I was like an undergraduate, if you said a writer and you said Howard University, it was Sterling Brown. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was Sterling Brown to a point that one person who I feel gets overlooked in terms of Howard history would probably be Owen Dotson. 
because people see Owen Dodson in terms of, maybe, you know, the theater and, and Howard, but you know, Owen Dodson was a very significant and important poet, but he was overshadowed because, you know, when you think of Howard University, you think of, of, of Sterling Brown. And that's where I wanted to be. You know, I wanted to say if, if, if somebody mentions Howard University, they would think of me. And that got to be a point, you know, I mean, I look up, I'm still waiting for somebody to paint over the mural of me in, in, in the bookstore, but <laughs> at least I'm still there. Yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe they'll claim me like Kamal, Kamala Harris <laughs> if I run for something. <laughs> 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 right now, you know, I mean, that was a good point in my life, you know, and, yeah. and I got introduced to Sterling Brown and that, and that was very important. So how, if, if you could, just define what literary success means to you. I don't think I've had literary success, you know, um, you know, I mean, I've got some plaques behind me, you know, <laughs> you know, to me, you know, I really hadn't seen that because, you know, what happens is that many times people don't know what I do. You know, I, I would say, for example, one major thing which I did was the, by e-channel in which I interviewed Charles Just for an entire year. You know, now somebody could, would have a problem even conceptualizing that, okay? And I took pride, and I took pride in that, you know, and, and, and Charles took pride in that, you know? Uh, and it was all the books that came out of that. But that was something I took a lot of pride. I said, okay, this is something where people would look at me and just totally forget about this, you know? Mm -hmm. And that has a lot to do with the range, I think, of my life, okay? I remember my friend, Barbara Berman, when we worked together, we had a press together here called An Enemy Press. And when Barbara Berman read my memoir, Fathering Words, she said, oh, you know, Ethelbert, you said nothing in your memoir about your work with the Jewish community. <laughs> you know? Well, I didn't, yeah, I, I didn't say anything about my work in the Jewish community. There's nothing in that, my work about with the Palestinian community, but I was building these bridges, you know? Uh, and I feel that, you know, um, I hope this is why, you know, I'm still trying to save as many things uh, so that people will have a sense of the range of my work because I feel um, I'm connected to so many different people that you seem like we go back. I mentioned Amasu Bolton. Yeah, okay. Somebody may do a book on Amasu Bolton. I'm happy for that, okay? Because one of the things I've learned as a literary activist, too many people get overlooked, okay? I, I take credit, for example, for promoting and pushing Dolores Kendrick to be the second poet laureate of Washington, D.C. OK, mm -hmm. because I knew that Dolores Kendrick would be overlooked. Somebody would go from like um, Gwendolyn Brooks, win her Pulitzer Prize to Mary Baraka. OK, so if you were a writer in like like 58 or 61 or whatever, you're overlooked. You right. know, I mean, nobody, nobody's doing a thesis on Gloria Odin. You know what I mean, I can, I can go through a whole bunch of writers from the 1950s. OK, and, what, and I tell you what's going to happen now. Somebody's going to go from the Black Arts Movement to Kaveh Kano, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right? So so me, Amos, Delani Davis, I go down the list of people. I mean, if you're, if you're not into Zaki Shange, you might just be overlooked, okay? Somebody's gonna go, you're gonna have that little book of, of anthologies, you know, that come out, like the, the Norton the Norton 2.0 or 4.0, and they're gonna go from the Black Arts Movement to Kaveh Kano, maybe mention the Dark Room Collective, because that's how they think, you right. see? Okay, now how do I get around this? Because I'm literally asking, I figured out a way of preserving my legacy. The same way Jimmy Baldwin realized that there was a point when he was in Harlem and he realized the only way to survive is that you had to come up with a gimmick. <laughs> and he said for him, it was the church. <laughs> and, that's, and that saved his life. So I realized with all these writers coming out of comic con taking workshop, there's one thing that I have found out that no one will ignore me for. And that's the fact that I write about baseball. <laughs> so while they are talking about, you know, the middle passage, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> ancient, you know, gumbo in the Gullah Islands or something like that, you know, jazz, <laughs> folklore, Ethelbert at least. You know, see, I knew I had mastered that during the All-Star game here in Washington, and they had a big exhibit at the Library of Congress, you know, they brought up things to celebrate baseball at the Library of Congress because the All-Star Game is here. And I went to that exhibit. I went to the exhibit, and you know where I was? I stood in the doorway of that exhibit, Library of Congress, and I said, if I die today, I made it. I was up there with the quotes by Ted Williams. <laughs> and I said, that's it. Yeah. That's it. You know, and, and what happens is that I know now that people, and they go back, when the Nationals won the World Series, mm -hmm. okay, you picked up, the, the Washington Post called me, 
okay? So I wrote a piece, okay? Then when they celebrate the national, in the editorial, they end their editorial citing my work. So for anybody going back, you know, like a Cub fan or a Red Sox fan or a Met, when did you win that year? <laughs> okay, when somebody goes back yep. and they write about this, the year of 2019 or whatever, I probably will sneak in there because somebody's going to be looking at the New Washington Post. What did they say when the, when the National, who wrote letters to the editor? And they're going to see at that particular time, I wrote about baseball. Okay. Yep. And I, and I realized that's something where, where I'm doing a, a second book of baseball poem because I realized that's something when you go to these conferences, it's like, well, Ethelbert, you know, I, I really wonder whether this interpretation that you have of Baraka's work is actually accurate, you know? And yeah, I just say, well, yeah, right. Well, this is what so-and-so batted, you know, in 1958, okay? <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? You know, I mean, because you go in these places and, and, and you always, people are like, well, I read this, I read all of, you know, when somebody says, you do the interview, when somebody says, Oh, yes. And I went to the library and I read everything. No, you didn't. You know, the librarian said you took out the books with pictures you know, and didn't bring them back. <laughs> you read everything. Give me a break. You know? It's not possible. It's not possible. not possible, right. You know, the only person I give credit for that is Malcolm X when he said he read the dictionary. <laughs> Started with our, and he said he documented, he started with art bar. <laughs> well, and, and, and it doesn't hurt, right? If, if you are in a, what, an eight by 10 room without the internet. Right, exactly, good. exactly. Yeah, and do you know, or you're going back to like, you know, you're Sonny Rollins or somebody like, and you're woodshedding, okay? Or going back to, like you said, we're talking John Coltrane. You know, like when he wrote Love, with Record Love Supreme, he was in the house, you know, he was pretty much isolated for a period of time. It's sort of like the, the spiritual connection with this music comes to him. That's right. Okay, so he had to be, and he's just this vehicle in which, but when people say that they, they um, read everything, stuff like that, they're making that up. You know, they're making that up. It's, it's the same way, for example, my friend, uh, the critic, Jerry Ward, many years ago, interviewed all these like prominent African-American writers, like, you know, what were their first influences, right? And everybody was like saying, oh, yes, I, I was reading Dostoevsky and, and uh, Tolstoy and, and, and Joyce was very important to me, right? And then it came to me and I felt like, you know, <laughs> like one of these New Yorker cartoons where the two little dogs are talking and, and the guy, they're at a reception and, and the person said, yes, they were talking about Kierkegaard and all I could say was bow wow. <laughs> So when you get to my entry after everybody's meeting like Joyce and Richard Wright, I'm into like Simon and Garfunkel <laughs> and Bob Dylan. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't even in the African American tradition. But I was being honest. I was saying I can't say I became a writer without listening to Judy Collins and Joan Baez. I'm not by the fact that okay that now I went to Howard University, I'm gonna say, oh, it was County Cullen all the time. Get out of here. It wasn't County Cullen all the time. It was John Baez and, and a little Phil Oaks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. But what happened, people reinvent themselves and they cleanse that sort of biography because what happens now, they see themselves upholding a certain tradition. And I'll document it with this. I remember asking Eugene Redman, who's an expert on the work of Henry Dumas, and I said, has anybody talk to Toni Morrison about the influence of Henry Dumas on her work. I mean, there's no way that you could be Toni Morrison as an editor, reading the work of Henry Dumas, you know, and not be influenced. I mean, this one short story, Fun, F-O-M, which is in the Black Fire Anthology, you read that and you say, oh, I can see why Toni Morrison could come up with a character with no navel. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, I can see why somebody could fly, you know, because what happened, his work, was that far ahead. I mean, Henry Dumas is one of the people that you would find doing the, the, the line of notes for Sunrun. You know, so you found out that, you know, he was on another plane. But yeah. here it is. After you win a Nobel Prize, you can't say that my high school teacher helped me. <laughs> you know, you get up there and you say, thank God, and then somebody else, a few disciples, but you don't mention the people that really influenced you. Right. You know, and that's the thing where what happens, and I say this as a literary activist, because I can see how people's careers develop. I can see how people reinvent themselves, okay? You know, I, I, I look up, and I knew very early. I was not going to make it as Eugene Miller. <laughs> you know, I better be T.S. Eliot or E. Ethelbert Miller, but then Eugene Miller ain't going to make it. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You know, just like I talk to writers, and I say, okay, no, we cannot use that photo on the back of your book. You know, you look like you're, you're middle management in Ohio, Toledo, Ohio. <laughs> you know? And you want a MacArthur? No. <laughs> or what happened if you look, you know, I had a friend of mine. She was a, 
she was she she wrote a book we're dealing with the nature of islam okay and she left and it, was, and it was very important because not a lot of people were being that honest what would happen to that but then i said but well, look at your photo and i said somebody who's a muslim is going to look at your photo and say a oh, girl you're a little too fly you never was a muslim you never took your shot <laughs> yeah, no no look at that look at that you got a button up girl <laughs> you know what i mean you look like muhammad ali's first wife who said this ain't for me muhammad <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah. You know, and, yeah. and this is where I see that, you know, on a serious note, when I look at each career, my own and others, I look at exactly how it's shaped, who opened the door, okay, how a particular incident occurred, you know, in the right moment, how that changed people's lives. And when I come back to my life, I'm blessed because at the same time, I crossed the path of Sterling Brown. I'm also crossing the path of Leon DeMoss, C.R. James all these other individuals that I feel, you know, I mean, I, when I would sit down and talk to C.R. James, I could not overlook the fact that this guy is talking to me in a hotel room and he would at one time talk to uh, Trotsky. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You just thought that this guy who you're talking to was talking to Trotsky many years ago. You know, you, if you are not moved by that, if you do not realize when you leave C.R. James that, okay, history better continue with you, because you just spent time with a person who spent time with you who is arguing about, you know, key theoretical questions dealing with socialism and communism at, at a particular time in history. And you cannot just leave and say, let me go get a burger. <laughs> you know what well, as I said earlier, history and humanity, um, what I cherish about you, Ethel Burr, in addition to the person you are in your writing, which is considerable, but you have this reverence for the past that's so obvious, but an appreciation for the future. And, and you're a bridge builder, a community builder, um, but you're just a, a deeply uh, spiritual and generous human being. So thank well, you. you know, when, we, when we met John, you know, just for the record, you know, one of the things that, that impressed me, me when I met you uh, is that you had a vision for building something. You had a vision for building something, not just for yourself, but for others, okay? You knew that it would be difficult, okay? This is before pandemic hit, okay? Uh, in fact, maybe the pandemic is a thing that is, is like sort of like Job or, you know, some sort of biblical test, a locust comes next. But what happens is that, you know, you're able to have a dream. This comes in and then you have to say, okay, how do I still um, contribute in terms of building what needs to be built because the community is not going to go away. We'll have different needs. And for you to, to even have this discussion to say, okay, we, let's, let's see if this works with one-on-one -on -one with different writers is a way of saying, I'm not going to give up my belief in terms of literary community, which is the same way for me as a literary activist because somewhere out there, there's going to be that person that if you just take that time, it might be somebody that you meet in the auditorium or online right now and all of a sudden because you listen to that person because you recommended the title to that person okay that changed the course of history and that's no different than rosa parks say you know i'm tired <laughs> you know i mean and, and and that little thing set things in motion you know or somebody saying okay king the meeting in montgomery is going to be in your church just be there <laughs> okay you know and so um, I thank you just in terms of, you know, um, what gets me up all the time are people like yourself that, that I'm blessed to meet um, because that shows there's some sort of degree of continuity in terms of what we're doing. Well, I appreciate that, sir. And, you know, the work goes on. Um, it's, it's a labor of love, of course, but I'm very cognizant of, of my betters and my role models. And, and I just thank you for your generosity, your time, um, but you're, you're an inspiration and, and my hope I, you know, I, I say that this series is selfish because I have a great time, but I <laughs> sincerely hope that uh, those of you that, that, for whatever reason, especially those of you that live in around the D.C. area that are not already familiar with this man, check out his work. If you're a baseball fan, he's written about baseball. If you're a poetry fan, he's written about poetry. He's written beautiful memoirs. Check him out and spread the word, and uh, let's, let's make sure we're reverent of, of those that came before us and helped, it, helped make it possible. Ethelbert, okay. it's always a pleasure okay. and, uh, to be continued because uh, right. we're not done with each other yet. <laughs> okay, I hope not. Okay. Take care of yourself. Stay well. Stay safe. All right, my friend. All right. Bye-bye.